Well, my friends, I'm here with my good friend, Drew Harris, and today we are going to talk about something that I think for us as artists is super special topic, materials, or successes, or failures, where those things lead us as artists when we talk about our art materials. It's going to be a great chat. We're going to share stories. <laughs> We're going to share how also materials influence the work that we do, because I think, uh, yeah. you know, everything is is, <clears throat> is uh, our connected in some way or another to the materials that we use. So before we talk about that, my friend, Drew, how are you? Good to see you. I'm very well. And I'm here with my good friend, Sergio Gomez, you know, another lively discussion about all things art related. Thank mm -hmm. you, sir. I'm good. You look good. So there Thank we go. You. We're both Thank good. We look, we're both <laughs> good. Yes, exactly. You had a good, uh, good day so far. Well, actually, had... it's funny because our friends who, who may not know, uh, we have like about, I don't know, 12 hour difference or something like that. 13 hours, 13 hours difference. Yeah. So my yeah. night is your morning. So I, right. I was, I was going to say, how was your day when it, actually your day just started? <laughs> just starting. But you know what? You're going to have a good night because, well, we're 13 hours ahead and I already know that. So <laughs> you're going to have a good night. I, I always ask Drew, <laughs> uh, how is the future, right? Because he lives in the yeah. future. You know, I, I live in the future. Definitely. Exactly. And it's so, good. Right. It's so far so good no big catastrophes today so <laughs> other than a you know banking issue <laughs> well, I that's, think a lot of, that's global a lot of now yes exactly yeah well uh super happy uh, to talk to you drew and also here with our friends about materials art materials mm -hmm. you know and why we chose you know the materials that we have chosen that you have chosen that i have chosen sometimes uh, i've been asked like you know why do i pick like in my case my love for the paper, my fascination for the paper. And for you, you know, you have come across also some really uh, special materials that you have come to use quite mm -hmm. a bit. And uh, so let's talk a little bit about some of those stories. You know, what is it about materials that we like, we love? Even sometimes the smell or a certain material could be pleasant or could be also irritating. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And walking into an artist's studio is like walking into a laboratory where you never know what you're going to find. What are you going to smell? What are you going to touch? What are you going to step on? <laughs> so, you know, we have some <laughs> or good... step in. <laughs> exactly. Some good stories to chat about. And I think uh, also it's an invitation for our friends who are listening to also share your stories with us. Drew and I, we love stories. So feel yeah, free to absolutely. share your stories with us. Send us a DM through Instagram or uh, any other social media that you can find those so that we can chat about these things. Uh, we would love to hear from you as well. So, uh, Drew, why don't we talk about materials? Where do you want to start? I think uh, this, this time well, I'll, I'll throw the ball at you. Oh, you're going to throw the ball at me. You always throw the ball at me. <laughs> um, okay, well, let me, let me begin by saying thank you. Yes, materials, they are, you know, as, as wide and as expansive as our planet at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a painter. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, I'm a painter, and uh, you know, I study drawing actually. So I love okay. the I love the medium of drawing. You know, with Conte and uh, charcoal and pencil. Um, you know, and I uh, also, uh, you know, in that time, I I really didn't study painting, so I kind of fell mm -hmm. into painting. So it was kind of for for a number of years, it was hit and miss with the with mm -hmm. the paintings, and what was easiest, acrylics. Yeah, you know, uh, but I always like to use the the elements we talked about last week. You know, the influences of our design backgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, our education, our teaching, um, our teachers, uh, and those influences around us, right? And uh, I always like type uh, because I was a type. That's really what I was most interested in as a mm -hmm. designer was a type type design. So I'd like, you know, I wanted to engage people in another level you know there's a visual of the painting but then i wanted to write stories into it so people could actually you know read the story and understand a little bit more maybe a little humorous uh, maybe a little dark whichever so i used i used um uh, you know you remember you know linotype or tech uh oh yes of course it called uh it was like the sticky letters right yeah, we used I, to use on yeah. signage and that kind of thing. You'd peel it off, and then you'd that was my first. On. That was my first yeah. assignment. The first time I went to a, uh, I was an intern at a graphic design shop, and that was my the, my first day. They had me uh, 
put a little ad with all the little sticker letters. <laughs> oh yeah, well, that, or the rub down kind. But mine, yeah. mine were generally the you know the sticky kind. So mm. you know, having a, a love of sort of kerning of characters and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. I was going out and buying sheets of these uh, stick on letters. You know, I would buy. Yeah. Of course, they'd only give you, you know, in the vowels, they'd only give you like four. And then on the, <laughs> yeah. you know, the other letters, there was like 10. So you always ended up having to buy like 10 sheets of this stuff just to make <laughs> one line of copy, you know. Uh, and uh, so I would just place them onto the canvas and I'd start painting. Oh, and really? Eventually the peel itself. it off. Yeah, peel it off. Mm-hmm. So that left a sort of some some narrative into the painting, mm-hmm. which I really loved. Um, it created a it created a new feel I hadn't seen a lot of at that time. Mm-hmm. So um, I eventually moved away from that, uh, but I mm-hmm. still love the concept of of drawing into a canvas words mm-hmm. or something that that is uh, you know legible, mm-hmm. and that really all started because of that that type. That I was using. It's, it's interesting yeah. because I've mm. also used a lot of text in my early work. Mm. Sometimes I still do it, but it was always uh, um, as a way of processing ideas right on the paper. You know, like the way an artist may have a sketchbook where you write ideas. I would write them right on the on the surface of of either the painting or the drawing, and but not as a way for people to be able to read it. So, but it added kind of like this other. A visual element that when absolutely people saw the work if they capture some words or some letters then they wanted to read it right and so that was always kind of fascinating for me how you know just the the few elements that were visual uh, of the handwriting you know people wanted to read them now i i never learned how to write in cursive i don't mm. know i still don't know how to write in cursive so i always wrote in all caps uh, like right. a comic, like a comic book almost, you know, and, and sometimes I would write all around the artwork or in, or inside thoughts, ideas, and then I would paint them over. But sometimes, you know, in, in, because my process is very, very washed paint, uh, in layers. So, um, you know, people could actually read certain phrases and often, that's right. in, often I remember in exhibitions, people would call me like, Hey, so you can't tell me what, what does it say? And I wouldn't remember, like, I don't know. You know, I cannot remember because I wrote these things in an intuitive way to flush ideas, but they were not really meant to be read or understood, not even by me. So right. like, I always had to say, I don't know what it says. <laughs> <laughs> well, I used to say, people would ask me the same, and I'd say, uh-huh. I don't think you really want to know. <laughs> so we'll just leave it at that, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. And it, it is, it's cathartic. You know, we can write in certain phrases or things were, you know, dealing with on a personal level mm-hmm. and then kind of eradicated in the painting. But those little marks become important right. in the overall piece. It creates an energy, you know, and leaving some words to, mm-hmm. to, to view or to read, you know, and, and then you get the people saying, well, what were you trying to say with this? What was the rest of the sentence? Which, right. which I usually replied, mm, A, I can't remember. And if I did, you probably don't want to know. <laughs> there you go so as so, far as uh, the materials that we have over the years kind of adapted i think every artist you know goes through a process of trying different things and then you adapt a certain material that you either stick with it for a long time or maybe at some point you change to something else but we all have a tendency to adapt something and then to mm-hmm. explore it for a while in my case it was a combination of three things you know if i were to uh summarize my materials over the last 25 years would be paper as a surface Mm. and the reason i love paper i just love the feel of paper and i think that fascination with paper came uh, when i took printmaker printmaking class in in college Mm. printmaking to me was fascinating i love the stone i fell in love with stonehenge paper right so i buy the yeah i I still buy the yeah, it's beautiful paper. So mm. I, I still buy the Stonehenge rolls, and I love doing charcoal on that paper and painting on that paper. So I always had a fascination with paper and also a charcoal, you know, also mm. as a way of mark making. And then the last thing as a material, acrylic. And the reason acrylic, I love it, is because I use a lot of water. So on, on a typical studio day, on one hand, I have my acrylic, 
you know, paint or brush or whatever I'm applying with or an iPhone, which I'll talk about later. And then mm -hmm. in the other hand, I will have my spray bottle. So mm -hmm. I'm always spraying, spraying and really making it fluid and decom almost decomposing the, the mixture. But yeah, uh, that's kind of like how I summarize my, how about for you? Well, the, I, I noticed that with, with your work, I, I like mm -hmm. that tactile surface. You're, you're sort of putting it on, taking it off, wiping it, you know, mm -hmm. wiping it down and rebuilding it again. There's, there's a, there's sort of patina that you create with your right. work, which I really love. And I think that that comes from the drawing, you know, that's mm -hmm. sort of subtle and a hint behind the acrylic. I think the, one of the, the things I, you know, I grew up in an era where acrylics were just, just beginning to enter the market. Hmm. Uh, primarily painters were using still, you know, a lot of oils or, you know, house paints at that point, right? Sort of oil-based house paints, some water-based house paints, but the acrylic market hadn't opened up. Hmm. And I always felt, I always felt really that the acrylic market, uh, uh, the acrylics just weren't there. They were kind of dead mm -hmm. at, when I started using them. Uh, and I couldn't get a sort of really good quality acrylic. And that was what, in the mid eighties. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's not too long ago. Now, of course, we've got amazing acrylics, amazing <clears throat> right. acrylic uh, products and gels and mediums. And, mm -hmm. you know, oh my God, it's just a, it's just a, you know, world store of this stuff now. But at the, at that time, I always felt acrylics being a little bit, kind of the acrylic term was just a bit too plasticky for me it just felt mm -hmm. plastic mm -hmm. and i wasn't using real mixed media other than the type i wasn't drawing and then yeah you know building paint over it uh so i was never very satisfied originally mm -hmm. and i really didn't like oil because of it's you know simple uh it took too long i'm just not a patient guy you know right i'm not patient with paintings i want instant results and I want to be able to, you know, if I have an idea, I want to go right back in and work mm -hmm. on it. Right. So the acrylics allowed me to do that. But the oils were always like, oh, my God, I have to wait for eight hours, you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then the mediums, then, you know, everything was stinky and toxic. And, you know, so so the but but the acrylics developed really fast and I, mm -hmm. I began to really like them. But again, on my side, uh, I was traveling. So when I really began my career, I was traveling around the world and I was in different studios, primarily in South Asia. And at that point, you know, the art material stores were good, but they were limited. <laughs> so I, I had a very limited palette uh, and then mixing two mediums. I was using um, acrylics as the base and then tinting it with an oil glaze. So using, you know, a Windsor and Newton uh, liquid or something like that, early days of that, right? Mm -hmm. I, I would wipe down the surface that acrylics couldn't do for me. Right? So, so I had that. I had the combination of writing, and then I had the the elements of of um, uh, the oil level, and I and I really liked that. But then over the years, I found that the oils and all those really toxic thinners that I was using to, to apply it to the canvas were actually drawing out the oil, uh, acrylics hmm. like quickly, right? So I eliminated all of that eventually <clears throat> and just studied uh, the acrylic using acrylics. Hmm. But, and that's, but at some point you, you uh, adapted also as a medium what you call the acrylic glass, right? Which... Uh, yeah, I, that was... I, <clears throat> Yeah, that was probably only a few years ago when it started to to come out. And I, how did you, know, you arrive to recall, that? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I recall. I mean, I was working with um, uh, back in the I think in the early '90s. I, I did a trade fair where I was a judge mm -hmm. on the new products, new uh, art products that were coming out. And one of the companies was TriArt out of Kingston, Ontario, and they had this amazing acrylic product, not only in their liquid colors but in their medium so they had like a glass medium they had a top coat and i thought wow and i so i voted them sort of the best new product 
-hmm. And I worked with them for what, 25 years. Oh, wow. And uh, so they were always advancing, coming out with these acrylics. Whereas the bigger companies like Liquitex and Golden and so forth, they were just, they were kind of following what TriArt was doing in a way and then made it bigger, you know, mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, and so the, the, I got familiar with all of these top coats and acrylics and glass mediums and flow mediums. And it was fantastic. But again, you know, depending on availability, mm -hmm. I couldn't rely on those. Thank God, the, you know, the new, the, the bigger companies that are sort of more global started bringing out things like liquid Same. glass or yeah. what, what essentially is a pouring medium. Right. That's really what it's base name yeah. is, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because a lot of artists, I mean, not, not artists, but usually people who see your work in our gallery, uh, when they see the, in the tag, you know, acrylic glass, they always say, so what is acrylic glass? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Well, they like always think it's going to be, uh, they always think it's going to be a, you know, fragile and, right. and actually it's very, very flexible. Mm -hmm. However, you know, having said that, it's trial and error. You know, you have to, you have to test your products. Yeah. And that and product across the board is, uh, there's a learning curve in there, how to use it. Because so I it, found yeah, what I expected it to do, it didn't do. Okay. Uh, you know, as in drying times and, yeah. you know, flexibility. But unbelievable, once it's completely cured, uh, that it's no longer glass. It looks like glass, mm -hmm. but it's, 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 it's malleable. You know, you can yeah. roll canvases, you can crinkle stuff with it. There's no cracking. Right. So yeah, kind yeah. of like the, the way I was going to describe it for our friends who are listening is uh, very similar to like a, an acrylic uh, gloss varnish, right? Uh, yes. Where by the time it's, it's dry, but the difference is that you're using it also kind of like a supporting medium that you can mix with your acrylic so it makes yes. the paint very fluid yeah but it, the other thing i think it's trying to replicate originally was uh was the process of uh not enamel what's the term uh uh where you'd put a like you'd form the painting or whichever and then you would pour in a in a sort of glass like like a mixture. resin a resins resin. yes resins yeah. so like it was replicating resins Mm -hmm. in a way, but in acrylic fast drying, yeah. uh, you know, capability. So you didn't have to deal with all of these mixings and the toxicity. And, 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 and more flexible, as you said, you know, more flexible. Yeah, the rest totally. is not flexible. Mm -hmm. Well, I still have the product. Uh, I did testing with it in uh, what, in 2017 or 2018 on these little small pieces. And I tested them for a number of reasons because, you know, my my paintings and a lot of us put paintings rolled on airplanes uh, in different environments and heat and cold and dry and humid. Mm -hmm. And I had tested this product. I, I froze it, put it in freezers, uh, you know, on canvases. So I rolled them up, put them yeah. in a freezer for a oh, week really? and I take them out, let them thaw and then pull them apart to see if there's any cracking. And, and there wasn't, it's amazing. Wow. And to this day I can still, um, do whatever I want with that little 12 by 12 inch uh, test mm -hmm. piece I did. I can crinkle it up like into a ball, like a piece of paper mm -hmm. and then pull it back out again. And there's no cracking. So it's really, yeah. the mediums are fantastic now. And, and that, that opens up a whole new concept of how you can work. You know, you're not strictly just relying on color. Now you can work into these, you know, thick, applications of gloss or matte mm -hmm. uh, varnishes you know mm -hmm. no it, it, yeah. it's amazing how technology uh in terms of uh you know the, the equipment that we have or phones mm -hmm. and so much you know has advanced but also the materials that we use you know you walk now into any art store there's some huge ones here in chicago like you know blix store of course. Two, two three floors of just art materials like you could be yeah. there all day and go crazy, right? Just the amount of different material that we have or access to as artists. Yeah. And yeah. And, I, and I think one of the you know over the years uh, uh, working with so many artists too here as a curator, I've seen how many artists also their favorite store is not the art store, but it's the hardware store. 
Oh, more absolutely. And, more and more artists using, <laughs> you know, uh, materials that are non-conventional materials, but, you know, going to the hardware store and just grabbing cement, grabbing, you know, absolutely. you name it, different kinds of glues. And then just try trial and error coming out with really unique and interesting ways of, of making, right? Which that's, that's, yeah. what, that's yeah. what the material is for, for making, for creating. And uh, well, it's just, uh, you know, if you think back on the on the early what uh, you know fifties and sixties seventies that you know Rauschenberg Robert yeah. Rauschenberg you know all of the mediums that he was using not all of them were successful mind you right but he was bringing in all sorts of different applications you know nuts and bolts and pieces of metal and cloth and all of that kind of stuff so he was doing this mixed media kind of installation pieces. And, you know, for the most part, they've survived. There are some problems now, mm -hmm. apparently. But, and and that's, that's the biggest message I always tell artists. You know, it's great to go into the hardware store, and it's great to try all of these, these mediums. Mm -hmm. However, you've got to be very careful because they, you know, what they claim to do, you know, on your sidewalk may not apply <laughs> on your canvas, you know? Right. Exactly. And, and particularly when you think about the longevity of your art, you know, of for, course. for posterity and things of that nature. But uh, but it's really interesting. So maybe let's talk about some stories or maybe materials that we have worked with that have either failed or succeeded or have Go given ahead, us my, ideas for something. So why don't you uh, start with one it's, and then I'll follow with another story. Go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah. OK. Well, hmm. well, there's all sorts of stories in that, uh, you know, haunted past. <laughs> uh, yeah. The. <laughs> One of the, like, and I also say about, you know, we, you mentioned going into the hardware store and experimenting, yeah. right? And often it's by trial and error. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, <clears throat> I always tell this story. Well, I don't always tell this story. I'm telling it now, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, back in 2006, I had, had uh, been commissioned to work, acrylic work, a, a large work, 12 foot by 12 foot. Mm -hmm. So it was a big, big painting. And I started it in Canada. And I had to bring it over here to complete it and install it. And when I got it here, it was maybe two thirds finished. So it was so big, it wouldn't even fit into the gallery space. So I was painting wow. it outside. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and this is, this is kind of how you work with the mediums and you work with the elements to find something new. You know, I had, I had just arrived from Canada. So it was a long flight you know, many days actually just in preparation and bringing these tubes of paintings, reinstalling, a bit jet lagged, a bit tired. I started painting these works against the gallery wall outside. Of course, mm -hmm. it's in the tropics. And I was tired, you know, midday. And I, yeah. I took this huge 12 by 12 foot painting and I thought I'll just lay it down on the lawn and, and it will dry, you know, based on the sun mm -hmm. as I was working, right? Uh, and then I went off to have a nap and I came, I woke up like three hours later after these, you know, one of this, you know, coma inducing naps <laughs> Come and, I, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and I was, I woke up thinking, Oh, Oh my God, I got to get the painting. But in the meantime, it had rained. Uh, and it was like a torrential rain that had come and gone like the tropics mm -hmm. and the painting had dry, you know, had was wet. Then it got a lot wetter. Then it dried very quickly. And I walked out and the painting had recreated itself <laughs> into this amazing work of art. <laughs> like I really didn't have to do much more with it. That was done. Hmm. And I called the whole series. Then it, that sparked an idea. You know, why not use our elements to help create the work? Right. So I got into whole things, things as I was... I, I was leaving the canvas alone. I was starting it with ink and wash and some acrylics, mm -hmm. leaving them wet and putting them on the lawn. And I would leave them out all night mm -hmm. on the lawn. So the dew and all of this kind of thing that would we do its thing, on them, right? You would wake up in the morning and it was dry, but you'd realize that a bunch of creatures had walked over it. Some birds had bounced across it. You know, <laughs> a little bird, some a snail would have come on. Mm -hmm. You sort of taken a line for a walk and then exited off the back of the other canvas, you know, or back canvas. <laughs> yeah. 
And it was creating this amazing sort of mark making. And I had nothing to do with it. Hmm. And I left those elements in the painting. Yeah. So there's, you know, I'm using nature as the medium. Exactly. No, I, I had I, no hand in it. I love it. I yeah. love it. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's so, so many times in which what, uh, you know, a mistake might be, it's kind of like the beginning of something new, right? A new Absolutely. Discovery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that that's where a lot of us get to, or we, perhaps it's a moment of frustration mm -hmm. and you say, you know, you're working with acrylic or you're working with oil and all of a sudden you mix something in, you put some sand in it. You, you know, I remember using kitty litter, uh, <laughs> yeah. like a bag of kitty litter. I needed <laughs> sand. So I thought, <laughs> well, I'll just use some kitty litter That's your work, I, right? <laughs> to, to get up texture. Right. And I used it uh -huh. and it was, it was amazing because that's yeah. all I had at hand. So right. mixing the two mediums, the acrylic and the kitty litter. Hey, I mean, it, it was fresh kitty litter, by the way. It wasn't <laughs> fresh kitty, yeah. It, yeah, it wasn't like a box. I wasn't <laughs> reaching in and, you know, <laughs> separating the goods. It had no but smell. It, <laughs> it had no smell. And so that, that's the kind of thing, too, you know, using, mm -hmm. using sort of a natural element in our work. I, I once... Can be applied beautifully. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I once yeah. uh, I had a painting in the garage and I totally forgot and it was flat on the floor and I pulled the car in my wife's uh, SUV <laughs> and, uh, and so the, the tracks of the of the wheels ended up on top of the painting. And I looked at it and like, actually, that looks quite interesting. So I ended up using <laughs> using, you know, that in, in the composition. But the funny part is like in the backside of the of the canvas you you could see that the actual track of you know the, the tire track of the tire yeah so whenever <laughs> i took it to exhibitions people will you know the gallery would always look at the back like you know what happened to this <laughs> you don't want to know but it's it's good save you know they you don't need to know that stuff but it but again you know it's really this is the amazing thing about you know having an open mind yeah. working mm -hmm. as an abstract painter or any kind of painter if you see there's potential in everything. Oh, absolutely. And that's the beauty of being creative. Right. right. So, right. yeah. And I love the tire. I love <laughs> that idea. And, you know, there is some of the best art has been when we've destroyed it. Mm -hmm. You know, we walk on it. We, you know, we get frustrated. We throw it across the room. I had someone throw a painting of one of my paintings in a pool because I was so <laughs> disappointed in it. <laughs> and, and I just didn't want to see it. So I, I ended up throwing, throwing it in a it. pool. You know, it's kind of a, like a kind of a fun thing to do at the time. Right. Uh, and that changed the painting itself. Yeah. You know, yeah, it changes really. the concept of the painting. It didn't really change the painting. I pulled it out and I thought, I'm going to involve that action that I just did mean to some, into the yeah. painting somehow. And I'm going to tell a story about that. Mm -hmm. That's good. So That's good. Let me tell you a story of, of uh, time, again, thinking about materials in which I tried to... Uh, kind of cut myself short in something I knew I should do and uh, the consequences of that. So uh, before the pandemic, maybe a couple of years before the pandemic, there was a really uh, important show I was participating in Miami. And uh, it's a beautiful gallery in Miami. Uh, the painting that they selected uh, was uh, about 72 inches high by about 48 wide. So it's a really beautiful mm, painting big. of my daughter. Um, I use her silhouette on a swing. And like these beautiful, bright Miami colors, you know, bright uh, greens and kind of like a very spring like painting. Mm. And so, you know, uh, because uh, the way I work, a lot of times I paint on paper and then I adhere to canvas after the painting is done. Or sometimes I adhere the paper first and then I do the painting. In this case, mm. uh, I, I was just making the work. I didn't want to wait to glue it first. So I actually did the full painting on paper. So I took the pictures, you know, they love the painting. So like, okay, they, they, they wanted the painting. So like, okay, now it gets time to, I have to adhere it. Like I've been doing for the last 15 years. So I, my technique is down and it's good and it doesn't have any bubbles and it's perfect. So I'm, I'm decided like, well, I have to ship it on the next day. And of course, one of those things that I had a million things to do, I left it for the last minute. It was a Friday night and the family was hungry. They wanted to go eat. And like, I think I can do this quickly. I think I can pull it off. So I start, uh, you know, the process of uh, 
uh, stretching the canvas and then applying the, the medium, which I use uh, acrylic gel medium to adhere the, mm -hmm. the paper, mm -hmm. with heavy, heavy white paper like Stonehenge paper uh, onto the canvas. And I go through the process. I get it all, all glued. But part of the process, which is one of the most important parts of the process so that you don't get any bubbles, is for the next hour or so, you need to, I actually step on it. I like dance over it for while I'm watching something on TV uh, because it's just the applying that pressure until it's dry on both sides. That mm. will prevent any any air gaps to form. Mm. And I also yeah. use a little roller and I'm, you know, there for, I usually put something on TV and while I'm watching, I'm either st stepping on it or, you know, going with my little roller. Hopefully well, not course, without your shoes or with your <laughs> shoes. No, without the shoes, without the shoes, just with some socks. <laughs> Uh, and so, but the family was hungry and I'm like, well, you know, this is looking really dry. I, I think it's, it's good, you know? So I misjudged the painting. We all went for dinner. I'm like, I think it looks good. I came back and to my oh, horror, no. the painting was totally wrinkled, you know, like not just a couple of bubbles, but like, like if somebody took it and like wrinkled it, because what happens oh, is no. the, yeah, the, you know, the, the paper versus the canvas, they don't dry at the same speed. So as one dries faster than the other, you know, really uh, creates it's those the friction bubbles. there and the movement. Exactly, yeah. 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 So the canvas uh, shrinks more <laughs> than the paper. And, and that's why it's so important to be there for like an hour, you know, just putting that pressure. And if you do it correctly, it's beautiful. It's amazing. It, you know, it, it will never separate again. Uh, it will bond together. But so... I was like so shocked, like, oh my God, what am I going to do? This thing has to ship tomorrow. I don't have time to make a new painting or I'm too embarrassed to say, hey guys, you know, <laughs> I ruined the painting the night before I'm supposed to ship it. So I, I tried to like, there has to be a way to fix it. So what I did is I spent like hours um, peeling off the, the top of the, you know, when you have a really heavy paper that if you wet it yes. enough, you can peel it off. So yes. The, the surface of the acrylic that was bound to that first surface of the paper, kind of like a skin, like when you pull glue skin from, you know, dry skin from your fingers, like that, pull the entire wow. painting. <clears throat> and that, to my surprise, it worked. And then I, you know, redid reapply the process, it? reapply the process. This time did it right. And uh, it worked. It, it saved Beautiful. me a... So it yeah, didn't the, the it day. didn't cause any issues with the painting at all no no, no no because i guess there was still moisture probably if it was yeah probably dried it would not work but there was still moisture built into it and i was able to peel the whole thing off but man that taught me a lesson See, one of the never, nightmares yeah yeah never like try to cut uh yeah. you know a short uh a short into the process because if you don't understand your process if you know what needs to be done you cannot cut yeah. short because you're going to have a, a major problem. Yeah. And I think you knew that inherently, but, you know, family dinner was more important. So. <laughs> yeah, everybody was hungry and they were waiting yeah. on me. <laughs> yeah, this is why they say you can never depend on an artist while he's working because, exactly. you know, what, we know the process. We know that we have to sit and wait for it. Yeah. What you I know, should have and, done is like going for dinner and then come back and do it. But I, I'm like, yeah. ah, I think I can squeeze it in. And uh, of course, that didn't. Happen. Yeah, well, that's a, you know, but that's a learning experience, and that's mm -hmm. that's exactly what we we do from all of this. You know, I the 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 many times that we've, you know, we've done things uh, to our work, and and you think, you know, it's just the worst. You know, I I couldn't have done anything worse on this. You know, it's like it's the worst. And then you come back to it a couple of hours later, and you have a solution how to fix it. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some of the mediums I worked on. Uh, these uh, top coat mediums um, back in the early days when they were bringing it out, it was a gorgeous medium. You could pour it on and it would just, it would just go like glass, mm -hmm. but sadly it would go like glass. I mean, it was so fragile, the stuff, but no one told us that we couldn't use it on a flexible surface at the time. And it was an art product. So years later, I mean, I'd used it on a ton of paintings. Uh, some were mounted onto plywood, some were not. Um, sold quite a number, mm -hmm. sadly. Well, maybe. Uh, and um, one of the pieces that was that I, I I found a couple of years after I had done an exhibition, I had sectioned off one just small part and put this top coat 
-hmm. onto that painting. So it was, it looked like, you know, the classic eighties business card, you know, he had to, you know, matte yeah, yeah, and gloss kind of right. thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you would know that well as a designer. <laughs> yes. Anyway, the, uh, I thought, well, that's an interesting look. It's got this nice gloss section. It's got a nice matte section. And about two years later, when I went back to retrieve the painting from a storage, that entire glass area was cracked like you would get if you had cracked a window in your car. Oh, wow. It was just shattered. But oh, wow. it was shattered so consistently. <laughs> so beautiful. That, yeah, it was like everybody kept saying, how'd you do that? And say, well, it's a little <laughs> trick I've learned. <laughs> right. I, but actually, it was because of it the... It took me years the, to learn this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it took years to crack, actually. I think it took about two years to actually eventually crack to the point... And yet it still would not come off. You, wow. It wasn't, it wasn't peeling off. It just cracked mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it was still flexible, but yeah. because of the cracking, it was flexible. But I found out later that you had to use this on a, on a hard surface. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. on wood or canvas on wood, uh, somewhere that it wasn't going to, there was not going to be any bending or, you know, sort of, uh, the, the tug of a canvas. Right. Anyway, uh, so I learned my lesson on that, but actually the, the painting turned out quite beautifully. That's great. Uh, and, yeah. <laughs> and in the end, it was a different painting. Good surprise. But I still, yeah, but I still haven't seen the other ones I did. <laughs> with that. And that's a, that's always been a, one of those nightmares when you just wake up in the middle of the night and go, oh my God, I don't, I can't imagine what those other paintings look like. It's going to come but, back to haunt me one day. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and it was so slow, I'm sure, because, and no one would have even noticed it changing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually maybe it changed in, in the good, you know, for the, yeah. for the better, exactly. maybe it improved the painting. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Let, no, no, let's talk about now tools. So we talk about materials, yes. let's talk about tools, yeah. you know, but no, the, you got to tell the story first. Come on. Yeah. I'll start with that one. So tools, I think as, as artists, we are known for finding out of the ordinary art materials, tools, you know, to make or art with the artists who use their hands, artists who use, uh, you know, brooms, the artists who use the, all kinds of things. And uh, I think all of us, we have perhaps stories of yep. secret, even like secret tools that we use. I know there are a lot of artists who don't like to say what are their secret tools, but uh, over the years, uh, I've been, because of my way of painting, as, as we mentioned, is very thin. Um, mm. You know, I've, I've tried a lot of like um, squeegees or spatulas or painter's knives and i never like the the you know the finishing product because always the edges will leave a, a line will leave like a hard mm -hmm. edge mark and i hated that and for yeah, years yeah. i was looking yeah. for different things one day a friend of mine gave me a piece of glass that it was like all round uh on old corners and i used that for a while and then it broke and then like oh, i don't have anything until you know the iphone one <laughs> came out you know I don't remember the iPhone one was like this this very round brick that had oh, no hard perfect. edges it was beautiful right it, it was especially that one the uh, first edition oh of I the remember iPhone. it I remember it well silver back yes I exactly I have quite a few in my studio so uh <laughs> I, you know I've been an Apple user for a long time of course got the phone and uh, then a few years later I, I never throw away my my phones or my uh, iPods or all laptops i kind of have them in a bag somewhere so one day kind of looking around like maybe maybe this iphone could be you know used for my painting so i tried it and the result was like a miracle to me and i'm like i gotta find myself more iphone ones like version <laughs> ones and i did <laughs> and uh, so, so by the way if anybody listening uh <laughs> you know has, has an, an old iphone, iPhone one. one i think i've got one. Oh, I'll, perfect I'll save it, it, it for me save it save it yes, I'll, I'll, I'll get as many yeah. as i can and yeah, I, you know, the mark making that I get from that object, you know, is so beautiful that I just cannot get it from others. And there's just something yeah. about it even, and I like it even more when I put my paper or the canvas where I'm working on, and there's a little bit of roughness on the table, you know, because yeah. it picks up some of those marks as well in a, but in a smooth way, it doesn't break it because it's, it's yeah. so smooth. All the edges are so smooth that uh, it's just the markings is just uh, something that I have come to enjoy. So that's kind of like my secret tool or one of the tools that I, you know, has been part of my studio practice for a number of years, I guess now since 
I found that iPhone one. <laughs> well, I think that there's some sponsorship here. I, I, <laughs> exactly. I, I get the feeling right. that, yeah, <clears throat> when we put this on Apple uh, podcasts, you know. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Send me yeah, all your old iPhones. Uh, yeah, you know, there is there are things that I that I use. I mean, I I admittedly stole a little uh, uh, plastic uh, spatula type mm -hmm. thing that I was using in a residency that literally changed my whole existence as a painter. This one little tool didn't even have a handle on it. It was so old. And I just, well, I didn't steal it. Let's, let's, it just happened you to be in my bag. It. I, I borrowed it. It followed you. It followed you. It. But I'll tell you, you know, uh, I, I had to drill a hole in it uh -huh. and put a string on it so I could put it on one hook because anytime I was using it, which was generally all the time, I was losing it on the table because the thing would the thing was so small, it would blend in with the table. And I could spend, you know, 20 minutes doing a painting and four hours looking for it because you'd have to scan the whole work table until you saw it in there with all the paint that you've been working on. Mm -hmm. It's stuck in there. It's stuck in I wash it off and I put it away and I lose it again. And, and I still and what have was, it. What was it about it? What kind of marking would you be? Were you getting that? It was, it was like a squeegee. It was like a squeegee, little tiny, maybe two inch squeegee. Really? That, I, that, could, tiny? that I could that I could move around and it was malleable. It was it was rubber. It was actually oh, one okay, of rubber. it was an art tool that they had used or someone had used. And when I found it, it was just it it picked up. You know, when you pull a squeegee over something, you want it to pull everything with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, depending on the, the strength, right? Mm -hmm. This little this little squeegee thing did exactly that. Mm -hmm. I did I don't know how many dozens of paintings with that thing. Mm -hmm. And 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 the other one I well, I use similarly, uh, like what you use the iPhone for, uh, the iPhone one. I mean, not mm -hmm. iPhone four. Uh, the I used to use uh, invitation cards, little oh, yeah, little uh, you know four by five invitation cards that we used to have printed the mm -hmm. weight of that card so you could take that piece of card and you could apply a you know a brush load of acrylic down mm -hmm. and you wanted to get that old patina look yeah you could drag this piece of card across it it was just so light and so oh, wow. mm -hmm. beautiful to work with it would just flatten out the surface mm -hmm. but it would give you this nice sort of patina to it And uh, wow. I went through, I ended up going to a printer and just mm -hmm. having him cut, uh, you know, boxes, boxes and boxes of these little four by five pieces of cardstock. Okay. And they were just flexible enough that you could lift up the corners as you were pulling across. Yeah. And didn't leave any marks. And it was amazing. It was amazing. I mean, I went through thousands of these pieces, probably not environmentally mm -hmm. friendly, but Mm -hmm. They worked. <laughs> they worked. They did the job. Yeah, they worked. They did. <laughs> they did the job. Yeah. yeah. When well, some of the like speaking about patinas or finishing, uh, some of my most beautiful kind of like open spaces in some of my paintings or backgrounds per se, uh, are not done with the phone, but rather in a similar way, but with uh, paint lids. Uh, mm. So I I say the the paint bucket, you know, the two the one mm. gallon buckets, the lid. When it's kind of crusted, you know, with mm, dry paint. Yeah, yeah. So I put my paper on a big table. I spray it with a lot of water. And then I put paint. And then I mix it with, you know, rubbing against the surface in a circular motion. Uh, like with the I, lid. With the lid. And as it starts wow. mixing the different colors, uh, it's just it's like really, really beautiful. And then I can add or subtract, you know, as it's wet. And yeah. some of my, yeah. be my most beautiful finishing have been, you know, just with a lid. And if you were to uh, look at my uh, drawer of brushes, I think the more expensive brush I have is probably, I don't know, maybe 15 bucks because I yeah. use <laughs> cheap brushes and the good ones, yeah. they have lasted me for like, I have some brushes that are like 20 years old, you know, and uh, they're still around. Um <laughs> but that's interesting, you know, because I'm not a big brush user. Like I do to apply the the original mm -hmm. 
surface, I use brushes and I use all sorts of instruments to create yeah. painting. Like I said, the paper, the little thing. I found a brush in China or China made brush mm -hmm. that would load so beautifully with paint and water, you know, just that perfect mixture, right? Yeah. That I could, that I could actually use that one brush and do anywhere like a six foot by six foot painting and just keep, wow. and it would hold the load of the paint until I was, you know, across the painting. Wow. In all sorts maybe of like watching. a calligraphy or like a calligraphy. Yeah, no, it's actually have... very organic, almost like a, uh, almost like a, like a wormy kind of shape all the way oh, through wow. the canvas. And I could do the whole canvas with one brush load. Wow. It was crazy. Uh, and then I, I, I think I used it enough. I, I you know, I burrowed it down to a nub and I, <laughs> and I couldn't find that brush anymore. Uh -huh. And it was like, okay, well that's the end of the series then. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the tool doesn't exist anymore to make, to that's make right. anymore. Yeah. Uh, let's also talk about, you know, because I think this also relates to materials is the finishing of the piece, right? So we talk about the the mm. thing that we use to apply the color or whatever, the you know, the image, yeah. then the tool that we use to apply the image. But how about the finishing? You know, I think that's an, another important aspect of the piece once it's done painted or whatever it is that we all do. Sure. Yeah. You know, the, the finishing, uh, how you finish your pieces, how I finish my pieces, maybe that might be good to talk about a little bit. Um, because you paint not always on the stretch or with a stretch canvas, right? A lot of times it's on stretch and you stretch later, or or mm -hmm. kind of a what is your how's your how do you finish a piece once it's done? Uh, we never finish it; you abandon it. Huh, yeah, no, no. I'm thinking yeah, about yeah, like, yeah. I, I know, I know. <laughs> uh, no, I think you know when when I'm working on a stretcher or a restrainer. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm usually working deep stretchers, so anywhere okay. from two to three inches deep. So they become really quite sculptural on the wall. And if the canvas mm -hmm. remains on there, um, you know, I do my my coatings on the front, uh, whether it be a glaze, uh, you know, of liquid glass or just a, a glaze of acrylic. And and yeah, as I said, I mentioned years ago, I used to glaze it with with a liquid. Mm -hmm. uh, like as an overall sort of finishing glaze. Yeah. But I found problems with that years later. They, the paintings tended to sort of go slightly yellow. Yellowish, yeah. Uh, yeah. And although it said non-yellowing, I think immediately it's non-yellowing. Mm -hmm. But over time it starts to yellow. Uh, but, uh, and then I finished the paintings. If this is what you're asking, I mean, yeah. uh, as far as finishing the paintings, I, I tend to, I don't tend to want to frame my work uh, mm -hmm. with a float frame or anything. It's it can be done, but I I like the I like the simplicity of a good edged canvas. Mm -hmm. And you know it, this brings me to another point. This is a little personal pet peeve of mine that I've mm -hmm. been bothered by for years. Uh, and some people don't are not bothered, but I am. Uh, and it's my it's sort of o OCD, I think. Uh -huh. The the edges of a canvas, you know. Ah, okay. You, you, I thought you, you were going to talk about the signature. <laughs> oh yeah, well I could do. That's I another one. Talk about that, yeah. But the one I really am bothered by, you know, you walk into these very high end galleries in New York and Chicago and uh -huh. Toronto and Kuala Lumpur and Tokyo and wherever you're going, uh -huh. and you see these wonderful paintings, and then you look at the edge, and they're all drippy and they have finger marks and they've got you know oil. And there's, yeah, everyone says, oh, well, it's the rawness of it all. And I said, no, no, no. You know, I'm paying, you know, someone's going being asked to pay $80,000 for this painting. Mm -hmm. I think you could take the time to actually paint up. the edges and mm -hmm. clean it up. You know, uh, is there something about this purity of act that, mm -hmm. you know, you have to have the, the artist's mark on the side? No, I don't think so. The painting is what you're buying. You're not buying the thumbprints and the, the dripping around it. Right? <laughs> so I'm very particular about that. You know, and I make sure I'm I'm very clean on the edges, mm -hmm. uh, and it's usually painted like a charcoal gray, something neutral, mm -hmm. right? And that just sort of keeps the painting, uh, you know, looking good. It's complete. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I I really I have a hard time with this. You know, you're asking me to, to buy a painting for 10 or 20 grand, you know, and yet the artist couldn't take the time just to maybe clean the edges. Clean that a little the bit, yeah. You know, yeah. 
So yeah. that's my OCD. But anyway, <laughs> uh, and but, then the signature. I just yeah, don't the like signature signatures. is also part I just of the don't like signatures. Mm -hmm. I just find them. You know, I I just don't want to see them. Uh, you know, Rothko didn't put his name on the front. You know, because the signature is his work, right? Mm -hmm. And the signature tends to be a whole other art form altogether for some people, you know? Yeah. They got these big <laughs> loopy names and, you know, oh, this is beautiful. And now with the advent of, you know, design, you can get your your name designed as a logo, you know? Yeah. And then they try to replicate it in paint on the canvas and you just go, oh, <laughs> I see nothing but your signature. Yeah, you know? yeah. But you still sign them in the back though. Right. I sign them on the back. I label, I sign, I date, uh, I t where it was painted. Okay. You know, because over the careers, you know, our many careers, we're painting in different areas. You know, we're going to residencies, that kind of thing. So I always make the dates, the place, uh, whatever residency it is, titling, signature, spell my name, not just my signature. And, um, And that gives a good archival sort of, you know, perfection there. <clears throat> what do you do? Here's a, here's a question on that. Uh, what do you do if you say you finish a painting, right? Mm -hmm. Five years later, you're st still in your studio. Like, I'm going to repaint this socket. So you repaint it. It's a completely different painting, but you still have, have a sign in the back. So what do you, what do, you do in that case? Well, I've done, <laughs> yeah. I've done that many times. I've done that many times. You have to, I know. Yeah. Uh, and we all do. We all, uh, come on, let's admit it. We do yeah. that. You know, I, I have no problems with that. Uh, you know, a painting has an existence and, you know, mm -hmm. if, and, and they have an energy, right? And if nobody, if nobody responds to your work and you can post it, you know, time and time again, every day for a year and still nobody re relates to it, you know that it's not probably hit the proper mark. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why it's still sitting in your studio. So, you know, why not? Uh, but yeah, going back into change the signature or change the, the title. The date, the date is the hardest thing to do. Like, shoot, what should I do with the date? <laughs> well, yeah. And then, you know, the common artists would take their white acrylic paint and they would, you know, paint <laughs> it out and then sign it again. But eventually that that signature it, ends up soaking through. So exactly, now you've got I was say that, yeah. three titles, three dates, three signatures. <laughs> <laughs> But I, you know, I, or I just put a piece of paper over it or put a, another piece of canvas. I'll yeah. stick another small piece of canvas. I have to, oh, but I, okay. I don't, I don't recommend that because that canvas, even that little piece of square canvas that you've reapplied to the back of mm -hmm. your work, it will show on the front. Yeah. It will because it's contracting and expanding. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So yeah, I, I recommend, you know, I don't know what I recommend. Just <laughs> what I have done you know. is I use, uh, uh, instead of using a, a white paint to cover it, mm. I use a, a gray, uh, mm. darker gray. So that, because if we, if the old signature seeps through, it's never in the intensity of full black so it's always like that's a gray true age. so i use like a that's true gray, that's a good then point I find it with a light, lighter color but but this is something i have done too like because then it would look really weird like you have like this splash on the back with just like a gray box so i would like sometimes i like add a little bit more of that gray in the back like if if like paint splashes <laughs> you know just well again you know i don't like time yeah Yeah, I, I tend not to do that. You know, I try not to do that as much as, as we should because, you yeah. know, we're trying to cover up a previous name or whatever. Exactly. There's actually no problems with just scratching it out and re-titling it, really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because the danger of, you know, and a lot of our the members at Art Next Level and people that know sort of the, the, the mechanics of painting and stuff, They'll say, well, you know, if you put a big square of paint on the back of your canvas, it's going to have an effect on the front of the canvas, too. It's going to contract, you know, it's, right. a, it's, it's a wet product on a dry product on a dry product. And it's going to, you know, it, it's got the potential to screw up the front of the painting. Right? Exactly. So I tend to just sort of black it out. Yeah. It's still the signature, it's still the, the new name. And yeah, maybe it's a different date. It doesn't matter. I don't think it matters. And. 
I think the, the people see a history in the painting too. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, we all change our minds. Exactly. No, and, it, yeah. and it's totally fine. And uh, you know, but these are kind of fun stories of things that we have all oh, yeah, and tried and <laughs> screwed up so here. And then. <laughs> I got to ask you something. This is just we'll just. I think we only got a few minutes left here, but I, I want to ask you. Uh, you know, what were your what are some horror stories of your work, you know, in the mediums and, you know, what's happened when you've put work out publicly or has anything happened? Uh, any funny stories there? Well, I, I, uh, yeah, well, I have, uh, I have a couple, um, well, I can tell you actually a couple of quick ones. One uh, as a curator too, like a, a, a mishap as a curator when mm. in my early curatorial years where, um, the main there was it was a group show, and uh, it was early early on in my in my curatorial career. And there were some really big paintings, and the, one of the main paintings I hung it upside down, and I didn't realize <laughs> until the opening. And there's a lot of stories, you know, that has happened before, or collectors who buy it and they hang it upside down. But like for the main opening, and having the artist come in and say, "Sergio, that is upside down," and then I and because it was a horse and somehow I'm, I'm pretty good at remembering the pictures that I see and <laughs> when I come around, but for some reason, the horse, for some odd reason, it had to be upside down. Right. But when I saw the horse, like, you know, you don't put a horse upside down, except <laughs> for this painting, it was supposed to be upside down. And yeah, when I went yeah. back and checked in the photograph, like, shoot. So like, like, what do you do? Right. Like you have all the people yeah. there. Do you change it? Or did you leave it? You just go whistling over. <laughs> exactly. Just or turn hide. around, everybody. I'm just going to turn this baby around. Or hide in the back room. Like, you know, where's the curator? <laughs> I don't know. He's gone. Um, so that was one um, that happened. Uh, also, uh, another another one. This was more of a... And something, I think, a, a good pointer for every artist, too. When you are submitting or bringing, actually, artwork to a show, even if you have already put wires and hooks in the back, always double check them because sometimes, you know, you have a wire or a hook that if that piece has been hanging in your studio for a while, it might start to get in loose. So mm-hmm. I had a, a large piece that fell right in the middle of the show. Yeah. Everything not because out. of our fault, but because uh, the, the hooks were already like corroding in the, in the mm-hmm. wood. So, you know, uh, that's a responsibility of the artist, right? And sometimes we don't think about those things. We just take it over the ones and we just go and wrap it up at the gallery and we think we're done. But that is so important. Yeah. I think it's a quick pointer there. And then one on the personal note as an artist, uh, uh, one happened, uh, a painting that I was working on. I think I may have told you the story. I was painting, I was painting on the studio, a big black painting that was on the floor. So I buy like the big jars of paint. So I use uh, like... Uh, plastic knives to pull the paint from the jar and then put it in my palette. So it was so late at night and I was so tired and uh, so I, I was putting paint and I took that knife and then I threw it and I, I thought in my mind that it landed outside the painting. And I didn't oh, see no. that it actually landed on the edge of the painting. <laughs> it's plastic. So imagine full of acrylic paint, plastic knife. So I go to bed, wake up in the morning, um, <laughs> you know, putting the, the paint up like what happens you know that big uh plastic knife plastic like like picnic knife not even a good looking (laughs) knife just picnic knives like stuck in the front of the painting and again it was a painting for another show that i had to deliver so like what should i do so did you make it work so this is what i did i painted the the knife also colored black so it kind of blended with the background and i took the painting took it to the show and in the opening you know only a handful of people notice it and uh Mm. They uh, they ask me so, what's with the knife? Like, well, what do you think? You know? <laughs> so I had some really good conversations about oh, the, about the knife. You see and, that uh, that adds that adds value funny. to the to the work. You know, adds adds value to the whole concept of narration. You know, to the story, the yeah, narrative exactly. that's in your work, right? Yeah, uh, and I I fully believe in these sort of happy mistakes. Exactly. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's fantastic. The one. Yeah, I, I know we have to go now, but I'll just, I'm just going to tell you a funny one that happened to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. In a gallery setting, you know, mm-hmm. always make sure your paintings are dry. Yeah. Yeah. Before you hang them. Right. Before, like, so this is a good test, you know, always prepare work so that 
you know, when you get to the gallery, you know, they're dry, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because I had one experience where uh, I was doing a show here in Kuala Lumpur and it was a big show. Uh, it was a, I, again, I was doing, I'd been doing a number of solo shows here, but this was a really particularly big one. And we mm -hmm. had a very big VIP guy coming mm -hmm. from, I think the Canadian high commission was going to open the show. Okay. And, uh, yeah. So half, you know, we had the, one of the feature paintings, which is the first one you would see when you entered the, the gallery is beautiful gallery. Um, it just didn't cut it. You know, there was something mm -hmm. wrong with this painting. It just didn't <laughs> have my a finishing thing, you know, on it. Yeah. So I, I borrowed some paint, oil paint, red oil paint, like vermilion red oil paint. And I, I added a section of vermilion red oil paint, just, just a little sliver of it mm -hmm. on the painting. And this was like the feature piece. And I sort of just yeah. thought it just needs it something. So I did it in the afternoon. We had the big function that night and, uh, and, uh, the, the VIP, you know, was leaving after, after, you know, talking to the show and addressing the show and everything else. And someone says, Hey, can we get some pictures? And of course he stands in front of that painting. And then the photographer's like, okay, can you get back up just a little bit further back up there? Okay. Just a little bit further. A little oh bit no. Further. And I've got his, I've got my arm around the guy or something like that. And there's like four of us and he's pushing back and he's pushing back and he's got to go to another function and he's, he's getting impatient. And I look down and his suit jacket has <laughs> taken the big swash of red <laughs> and kind of just kind of made this big, like aggressive marking behind mark on the painting. Right. And I look at his back end and I was like, uh Oh, how are we going to deal with this one now? Here's his VIP now with a, with a vermilion red paint stuck to his bum. Oh my uh, goodness. <clears throat> and so there, hence there was a lot of dry cleaning expense on that show, <laughs> and, uh, but he, he, he took it with a grain of salt, but he, you know, actually, he actually improved the painting. So <laughs> I just <laughs> left it like that. And that became part of the narrative in the story. You know? Right. Oh, by the way, that VIP made this mark. Exactly. And it's like, Oh my God, I love that. <laughs> and it was a collaboration piece. <laughs> yeah, a collaboration between uh, non-painter and painter. So, Absolutely. Yeah, so the, those are the kinds of things that, you know, it's got a hidden meaning in there. You know, yeah. make sure your work is dry because you never know. Absolutely. And everybody wants to touch a painting, you know. No, that, so. that's, that's great. I think we can we can spend another two hours just talking about stories oh, and, uh, and things like that. And I'm sure our friends have them too. So, you know, as we wrap up the episode, my friends, uh, just remember, you know, as an artist, experiment, you know, be free. Yes. Um, you know, uh, it's okay. It's okay to try and it's okay to fail in the studio. You know, you make something yeah. out of experimentation doesn't work. It's okay. You know, that experience will lead you into the next painting yeah. or into the next work of art, whatever it is that you do. Uh, but experimentation, I think, is such an integral part of us Absolutely. as artists. And that brings me, uh, just as we wrap it up, uh, for the month of April, we're going to be doing uh, Inside the Art Next Level Academy, Inside Our Community. We're going to be doing a challenge on building a body of work. Not that you have to do the body of work on April, but kind of creating a roadmap. How to think about it. How do you plan it from the studio, from the marketing aspect from getting it out into the world, galleries and so on, sales and, and all that, all that relates to uh, building a body of work. What we're going to do pretty much is creating a blueprint that you can use over and over right. and over, you know, as you embark in creating body of work. So I think as artists, that's what we do all the time. You know, we do one body of yeah. work, we finish, we do another one. So it's going to be great. Dr. Ina Gomez is going to be helping us with some of the mind, mindset and believing uh, in, in our very work. Very important part. Absolutely. And Drew is going to help us with the studio practice and I will help mm -hmm. also with the marketing aspects of it. So it's going to be really fun through the month of April. So you can check it out at theartistnextlevel.com and uh, join us. It's going to be a great challenge. Four weeks learning, talking about sharing stories like this one and oh, uh, you know, getting, getting really excited to make our next big mark as well. So yeah. Uh, having said that, Drew, where can our friends find you on, uh, on Instagram if they want to see some of your work or chat with you then? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> Drew Harris Art, D R E W H A R R I S A R T, and that's on IG. And um, yeah, have a look there. And I've got to remind people too, you know, if you're listening to this and you have an idea, come on, you know, mm -hmm. 
don't be shy. Just give us some ideas of, of what you want to talk about. Right. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll find some way to, you know, spend an hour talking about it because that's kind of what we love doing. Yeah. So if you've got ideas, uh, don't be shy. You know, any idea is a good idea. So Absolutely. Uh, let us know. And, and perhaps, you know, next week we'll have something that you want us to talk about. Love it. Yeah. I love it. Of course. Yeah. And of course, my friend, you can find me at Sergio Gomez Art also on social media, anywhere there you can find us to connect with either of us. And remember that we also do have one-on-one -on -one sessions available uh, yes. that you can sign up at the artistnextlevel.com. Just go there. You'll see the link at the top and you can uh, yeah. have a quick uh, or a nice, not a quick, but a nice one-on-one -on -one sit down chat over Zoom. And those sessions are really awesome. So having yeah, said that, yeah. my friends, we hope uh, you enjoyed this session. Please uh, share with your friends. Let us know your your fun stories or horror stories <laughs> in your art studio in the social media as well. And I will see you, my friend, at the next level. Goodbye. <laughs>